so in this new normal, uh, I had never done Zoom training like this. Uh, this is only like my second one. So thank you for, for bearing with me uh, to get the technology figured out. So it is my pleasure to be with you today, definitely. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, the Emerald Ash Borer just is gonna be this problem that uh, is gonna exist in our state. And, and uh, last year alone, we had two new detections in 2019. So um, uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but I am tired of talking about the Emerald Ash Borer, but as long as it's around, I appreciate your interest. And uh, we're gonna cover a lot of things today. Um, so I think, uh, I think, a lot of this that I want to cover is what can we do to combat the problem? And I think there's some very key things that uh, we can do uh, to, to uh, work against this problem. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about what's at risk, um, uh, hopefully give you enough information to understand the life cycle of the insect and how to, to identify it, uh, the damage, the symptoms, uh, share where it's been detected in the state as well as, you know, in North America. Um, but I really hope that you take away a lot of uh, knowledge about what we can do to manage. Uh, and we're going to, we are going to get to the chemical considerations as well. And I, and I think a lot of audiences, that's um, super important to, to a lot of folks. So we will be spending time there. And I want to finish up on um, maybe uh, some species that we can use to replace ash with. And I want you to be aware of, of multiple places. They're, you know, they're in Lawrence, uh, where you can see other types of trees growing because the more diverse our landscape is, the less threatened it's going to be by a new disease, a new insect, drought, whatever it might be. Uh, we've got to stop this monoculture, this monoculture mania, as I call it, this type of planting uh, that, that has, has occurred. So um, if you would, for my sake, as much as anything, if, if you would, in your chat box, let us know where you, you uh, are joining us from today. Uh, if you're uh, a private citizen, uh, please let us know that. Um, I assume that a, a lot of you are, are extension master gardeners, but let's just get some sort of demographics with the audience, if you would. And uh, that way I kind of have a feel for, for um, you know, who we're chatting with today. And um, I think I want to start out with things that we can do to combat the emerald ash borer. Um, and in a lot of these are true for uh, what was learned from Dutch elm disease. Pine wilt, for instance, it's also a, um, a problem that can be moved with firewood. So one thing alone that we can do is to not move our firewood. So when we have, um, you know, say a tree is removed and you want to keep the wood, you know, for, for burning, just keep it, keep it there. If you're going to camp out of state, travel out of state, whatever it is, even out of county, um, please don't do that because uh, Dutch elm disease was spread with the movement of raw material and firewood, as was pine wilt. Years ago, when I began this, uh, this position with the Kansas Forest Service, um, a outbreak of pine wilt in Colby, Kansas was traced to firewood movement from Baldwin City. So that's, that's how these forest health threats spread so rapidly, it's just the unknown movement of them. So with emerald ash borer, that's the same thing. Now there's a really bad bug that's in three states um, toward the East Coast called Asian longhorn beetle. And I'll visit about that at the end. That's another problem that's in our country. It's not been detected in Kansas, but annoying firewood movement could bring it here. Uh, Asian gypsy moth is getting some attention as well as, you know, the, the monitoring of even the European gypsy moth. So just not moving and transporting firewood is a major thing that we can do to, um, to not uh, spread these problems. And, and uh, when we have high species diversity in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our farmyards even, when we have species diversity we can combat these catastrophic loss of trees. 
And unfortunately, when I'm out doing inventories with communities, tree boards, um, there's these, you know, this is where you see the neighborhood. So if you see that top neighborhood picture on the left, uh, you know, in dormancy, that neighborhood was like 99.9% .9 ash trees. I think there was like three trees out of a hundred that weren't, that weren't ash. Um, this is where problems like the emerald ash borer are just so devastating. And the picture below uh, is a subdivision that, it, it was a pin oak alley. It, it was just pin oaks everywhere that the eye could see. So we really need to be careful and we need to hopefully um, encourage, you know, and as master gardeners, many of you are, um, um, this is where uh, having just a diverse landscape is just all so important is to provide, uh, you know, some buffering against these problems because at the end, as if we don't have landscape diversity, what's at risk is, our neighborhoods, We're, we'll lose the shade, we'll lose the energy conservation. And these images from a webinar that I took in several years ago from the, um, the Emerald Ash Borer National website, and you see the link there. This is what's at risk, is within a period of perhaps three years, going from a shaded, calming, uh, comfortable place to live to, to one where the trees are lost and then the shade's gone, uh, and then replanting. So it's also a very costly experience for the city, for the homeowner, whoever it is that's, that has to deal with the emerald ash borer. And in North America, we have 16 species of native ash trees that are attacked by the emerald ash borer. So what, what, what's so bad about this problem is that our, our native ash trees just don't have um, they just don't have natural resistance to this exotic insect. In Kansas, um, some of you may have heard John Standing and I talking about blue ash. You're not going to see those all too often in Kansas, but you, you'll find them here and there. The most abundant you're going to find are the green ash and the white ash. Green ash are going to um, are uh, common in woodlands. They're a lowland species. But I've also seen white ash on some of the upland sites in, in rural areas. And both, of course, you're going to see in community settings as well. And, and it's just not the, the species itself, but all the, the horticultural um, cultivars of these species. They're all at risk um, of the ash borer. And I don't know how long ago it was. Let's just say five years ago or so, maybe even longer. A professor at Wright State University found the, the emerald ash borer in um, white fringe trees in Ohio. My suspicion is that the ash were gone and the insect um, moved to that species. And so the fringe tree is in the, the olive family with the emerald ash borer. So in this case, the, the good news is that we do not have um, white fringe tree native in our woodlands. It, it will be a species that someone plants in their yard. Will it be devastating here? I, you know, I don't know that, but what, what that detection, I think, did is open the door to um, the possibility that the insect just very well might um, move to other species of the olive family. I think that's, that's a wait and see type of thing, but that, that was something that, um, you know, you don't know it's going to happen, but that's in Ohio, that's what they have found. So, you know, five years ago in 2015, the emerald ash borer was found there in Douglas County. So I don't know if you can see my, my cursor moving around, but this ash mortality curve, I like it very much. And I use it at any workshop that I do with communities as well, is that in the early years that the EAB is, is in an area the management options are at their highest. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, what we prefer to do, we don't want to find it, but if we are going to find the emerald ash borer in an area, we prefer to do it in these early years of one, two, and three at the very latest, because, you know, then the, the, made, the local um, governments, the local uh, public entities have a chance to, uh, um, look ahead in their budget to make sure that they have plans in place to manage the tree. 
but let's but let's look at probably and and Tom and uh, I would want you to chip in. But word has it that the the emerald ash borer is um, is not terribly difficult now to find in the city, especially. So chances are the emerald ash borer is in this range of rising, and so as the population grows, it grows very exponentially. So what happens then is when these, these populations just burst out in, in areas and in communities and in landscape, it accelerates extremely fast. I don't know that we're here on this part of the slope yet, but I imagine there in Douglas County, you're probably in this area. So what happens then when, of course, the population is raging, our management options are less. So I again really appreciate the opportunity to be with you because there's, there might still be some time in this, this arena, but time to do very much else than begin removing trees if they aren't treated, um, there's just not gonna be much of an option as time goes on. So this curve I think is, is just very helpful in understanding what we need to do uh, as observe, you know, observe our, our plants um, as well. So the, the emerald ash borer, it's, it's actually a colorful insect. It's considered a metallic wood boring beetle. It's in that category. It's about uh, a half an inch long, about a sixteenth of an inch wide. Um, it's, it can be a good flyer. Um, you see a range of half a mile to four miles in 24 hours, you know, left to itself. It probably won't fly terribly far. Um, the, be, the adult itself doesn't do the serious damage. Uh, the feed on the ash foliage, you might see some holes here and there, uh, but you know, the, the adult part of the life cycle um, isn't damaging. Um, and, and you might look there at uh, the, the picture from bugwood.org. Um, there are um, purple segments under the wing. So it is a, you know, it is a pretty colorful type of insect in a bad kind of way, I assume. And there are other metallic green looking insects that as master gardeners, people may call you and say, oh, I think I've got the emerald ash borer. Well, so um, if you need this chart, I'll send it. I'd be glad to. But what I want you to see is how the emerald ash borer compares to any of these other metallic looking green insects, and probably the bronze birch borer, the two-lined uh, chestnut borer, those are probably the closest. But see the bullet-shaped body um, and the size of the, the adult insect. Uh, the chances for you to see an insect, you're gonna really have to be paying attention or they're gonna have to be a, of such a high abundance that they're swarming. It's gonna be, I don't know, um, you'll just have to be looking for the insect. So the typical life cycle of the emerald ash borer is typically one generation per year. So when the adults emerge, uh, they'll breed within seven to 10 days. And if you look at the, um, it's, it's actually the larva that is the damaging part of this life cycle. And then when you see that females, you know, lay eggs, an average of 77 um, eggs laid in bark crevices. They can mate a few times and eggs hatch, you know, less than 10 days here. So when you see uh, how many eggs can be laid, you know, then it's understandable, I hope, in, in how quickly a larval um, population in the tree can, can uh, build. Uh, so um, adults generally emerge so, so insect emergent is based on degree days, and that's an uh, a term that entomologists use. For, for our purposes, um, uh, first emergence of the adults generally is around when the black locust blooms. So I have black locusts here, um, you know, where I live as well. So when it blooms, that kind of is my clue that, you know, where the EAB has been detected, uh, for sure, and even when it, where it's not, that that's about the time we're going to see emergence. And and like with so many insect emergence, just doesn't happen all in one flush. It could be, you know, about the time the black locust blooms, maybe on into July. So if you look at where we are now in the time of year, uh, larva, you know, very well could be in the tree. Um, 
uh, conducting its life cycle. So with the larva being the damaging part of the life cycle of the emerald ash borer, uh, it does, so, so the eggs hatch, the larva, um, uh, you know, is produced, and generally look at that picture with the different, um, the instars of the larva. So you can see how the damage, even in one season, can really increase. The first instar larva is small, you know, but as it feeds in the phloem, in the outer sapwood of the tree, the, the damage just increases. So it's feeding, it's building tunnels. So as the larva emerges, the tunnels get larger. The insect uh, consumes more of the phloem and the nutri you know, the nutritious part of the tree. So I, I realize that many of you um, may just be learning about trees and, and, and are private citizens. So when you think about the anatomy of a tree, the bark is the um, protective outer uh, layer of course, of the tree and just under the bark in the active um, area of the tree of the cambium where cells are actively growing. Those cells that are closest to the bark are the flow of tissue. So you all, I'm sure, understand photosynthesis or know that photosynthesis is how trees and plants produce food and energy for themselves. And phloem is the conductive, the vascular part of the system that moves the products of photosynthesis, that moves the food and the energy throughout the tree. Well, so, you know, this insect, it's not stupid. It's gonna go into a very nutritious, rich part of the tree, and that's the phloem, and that's where it's conducting its life cycle. That's where it's damaging. Um, it does feed in, uh, usually what are considered serpentine galleries, S-shaped galleries. And this is a bore that as it feeds uh, and, uh, and uh, pro you know, produces frass, and frass is just the excrements from the insect, it packs it into uh, the galleries. Of note is that this larva is white, legless, and then it has the bell-shaped segments. Can you all uh, see this bell-shaped segment. So these are very definitely distinctive features of the larva of the emerald ash borer, and these are the galleries. This is that serpentine S-shaped gallery uh, that um, when you begin to peel a tree, and we've done a lot of trainings with our communities, especially when it was first found in Kansas, uh, to peel trees as part of, um, and that's just part of our regular practice in survey and detection, also in Kansas. Uh, the emerald ash borer will colonize trees that are very small. Uh, they, they have found them in half an inch caliper um, sized trees and of course larger and, and it's quite possible that it could be present and you know you'll hear a range, you'll hear anywhere from three to five to six years before maybe it's detected. So you know just understand that's a kind of a fluid number but it could be a few years before the damage is bad enough to be detected and then before you might be able to find it in a tree. So when um, when I talk about the larva packing its frass in the galleries, uh, see this here and these are, um, this is a log actually that we uh, peeled at Wyandotte County Lake shortly after their mold ash borer was found in Kansas. Uh, we did, uh, we, and I'm saying we loosely, the Kansas Department of Agriculture is responsible for the survey and detection efforts in our state. Uh, and my agency, myself and others uh, with the Kansas Forest Service, we've had extension agents out with us. We've had federal partners from USDA out um, doing this survey and detection work, trying to find it. Uh, so, um, at Wyandotte County Lake that day, we were able to find a tree that had some pretty serious galleries and the frass packed in it. So I hope that you can see that characteristic. And lo and behold, when you, when you follow the path of the galleries, you often find the larva in it. And you can see just how very damaging this is. And these, this log was probably um, harvested and peeled, oh, let's say October. So this is, you know, getting toward the end. So early on, I mentioned that um, the, the emerald ash borer is an exotic insect, and, it, and it, its native range is the Russian Far East, Mongolia, China, uh, those countries that we generally call Asian. I, and you can see just by how it sits on the penny that it's a very small insect. It, it really, truly is. 
And so the, you know, of course the problem is been, like I said, is that our native ash trees don't have natural defenses against this exotic insect. Our native ash trees have evolved with several native ash borers. So it's very possible that, you know, when there's ash damage, um, there may be native borers also in the tree. There's always that possibility. So um, the emerald ash borer is spreading and it has spread. It first was detected in Southeast Michigan in the Detroit area the summer of 2002. It has since uh, been detected in 35 states and 10 counties of Kansas. So if you'll go to the Emerald Ash Boar National website, and that's emeraldashboar.info, if you go to that website, you'll be able to see updated maps of where it's been found in Kansas or in the county or in the country several times a year. And I go in there, every time I do one of these presentations, I go in there to see if there's a new map. So what you can see here with these maps is where the quarantine zones are for the um, Emerald Ash Boar. So here in Kansas, we have an intrastate quarantine for our 10 counties. Thankfully, it's all been contiguous where it's been found. But the, re the, real <laughs> the realism with this, with this insect is I could drive from Kansas City all the way to the East Coast and stay in a, quarant you know, in a quarantined area. So this is how bad the insects become in the country and also in our state. And when Johnson County had a detection, so in Wyandotte County, it was first detected in the state in 2012. The next year it was picked up in Johnson County. And I don't remember the year my friend, my friend Greg Van Boven sent me pictures of, he, he's a commercial arborist. And so he sent me these pictures of how he was finding it. But I wanna say that it was probably two years after it was found in Johnson County, maybe three, that uh, uh, Greg was, was, finding, was finding the insect pretty readily. And this is a 10 inch diameter tree that he peeled that just was pretty riddled. And I think this was like the, you know, the more urban area of uh, Johnson County. I wanna say this was Prairie Village, or yeah, Prairie Village or one of the interior counties um, where this log came from anyway. But uh, just a few years after it was detected in Johnson County, those that know, know how to look for it were, were able to pick up the, the signs and the symptoms of it, which in this case, uh, it may be that first you see yellowing leaves. Um, deadwood development at the top of the tree is typical. Um, that's going to generally be what catches the untrained eye, and it's going to continue through uh, the canopy. And, and a third is maybe half of the canopy could very well be dead in a year. With this picture, can you also see, I hope, it's not a great picture, I realized, but I hope that you can also see the epicormic sprouts, water sprouts is another term of that, that are developing at the base of the tree. Um, and um, sometimes the, the larva will, uh, will uh, be in the branch unions of the trees, and this may be a protective instinct to stay away from woodpecker damage, but uh, Jason and Lansing sent me these pictures and it's likely that the EAB was in the, uh, the, the branch unions uh, of, the, of this tree at least. And, and what is a typical symptom uh, and sign of the emerald ash borer when the infestation's pretty bad is that the bark will crack in the tree. Uh, woodpecker damage, uh, when, the, when the populations are higher in an area, uh, woodpecker damage also can be a sign and a symptom to look for, as well as, you know, those S-shaped tunnels we've already looked at in these D-shaped exit holes that are one-eighth inch in size. Now, what you want to do, and make sure that you do, if you're examining a tree and you see what you think is a D-shaped exit hole, if you can safely and carefully uh, shave the bark down, that's what's what's been done here is the bark's been shaved because sometimes it may look d-shaped out you know on the surface of the bark but it could change shape it could change sh change size excuse me as you peel down and go closer to that cambial area so this is one way as a field 
you know, kind of your first step in the field, you go, okay, that doesn't, that looks like a D-shaped exit hole that looks to be an eighth in size. This is just one way to take an extra step to confirm, yes, indeed, you're finding a one-eighth inch D-shaped exit hole. This, um, this uh, decision guide, from, um, I think it's from Purdue. I got to look at my big screen here. Purdue and, and several other partners. What I really like about this decision guide, and Master Gardeners, I, I would encourage you to, to use this as a resource to visiting with people, but also anybody that's on the line here that's a private individual and you're wondering about what to do about your tree. What I like about this decision, guys, is this guide is that it takes you through a step-by-step -step process. And it starts with, do you have ash trees on the property? And if so, how many and where are they? And then the next question being, do you want to save your tree, your ash tree from the emerald ash borer or not? And if your choice is, no, I'm not going to save it, then understand the ash is going to be killed and it's not going to need to be cut down. If you do want to try to save your tree, then the next step is if your tree is worth saving. So what I like about this, this, um, this flow here is to help you understand what your steps are in making decisions about your trees. And it takes them on down to the, the size of the tree. Uh, and there at the bottom where you see, um, is your tree larger than 20 inches in diameter? That's also then kind of, uh, I think, kind of guiding you on, on um, treatment options as well. Um, if, you, if you're a private citizen and you would like this decision guide, reach out to Sharon, reach out to me, whoever is the most convenient, and we would certainly be glad to send this to you, no doubt about that. It's, it's a very good resource for that. Well, I suppose a lot of you are uh, really concerned about uh, whether to treat or not to treat your trees. So if I'm doing a workshop in a county that does not have a detection yet of the emerald ash borer, the first question uh, is going to be, has the insect been detected in the county or within 15 miles? Well, for those of you in Douglas County, that's a moot point. It was detected in your county five years ago. If you haven't been treating your trees and they're worthy of treatment, you know, now's the time. But I suspect a lot of folks have already been treating their trees. Then the next level of de uh, decision making with chemicals is what's the health of the tree today? Those, those trees that are the healthiest, in the best condition, that are important to a particular landscape, those are the trees that you know, I would encourage the investment of treatment to be used on. Because the reality is not every ash tree deserves to be saved. Not every ash tree is going to be in good enough condition because it could be that it's stressed. You know, we've had some really pretty awful weather extremes, haven't we? And we always do in Kansas. We go from cool to hot in a hurry. We go from uh, cool to, you know, severely cold. We get a lot of rain, not enough for rain. Drought has just been awful, it seems, several years. So our trees are likely going to be stressed. And then the question is, how stressed are they? Do they have some serious defects? And I'm going to show you some pictures coming up. Has the tree been storm damaged uh, or damaged in any other way? Is it missing 25 to 50 percent of its canopy? Those are many of the considerations on whether the tree is a candidate or not for, for chemical treatment. And I've got some pictures coming up that I hope will, will help you understand what I'm getting at there. Treatments have to be preventative uh, to try to protect the tree against the emerald ash borer because after that phloem that now you've seen, you know, um, with the peeled trees, after the phloem is damaged by the larva, it, and especially as the damage from multiple larvae, the chemical is just not going to be able to diffuse through the tree uh, because of the larva uh, feeding in those areas. Um, I leave the statement that not all treatments uh, will be effective on all trees. I use that just as, as a caution. When treatment is done correctly, when it's done on a day that the tree can take up uh, the chemical well, treatment's going to be highly, highly effective. But I just want you to understand that there are some variables where treatment may not 
uh, be especially uh, effective on trees. Larval damage is going to be one of those uh, considerations. Uh, and why should chemicals be used? Well, in community forestry, when we do our workshops with our, our cities and our uh, governmental entities, um, well, even with private citizens here, these are things that you need to think about. Chemicals should be used if the tree is of good condition and you want to keep it in the landscape for, for the long term. Um, to do that, though, you're requiring an investment for this infinite amount of time, and you, you need to just plan on the tree's lifetime if you really want to keep the tree protected. And from a city standpoint, a governmental entity standpoint, maybe they treat trees for a time to spread out the budgetary effects of removals. Because as you might imagine, removing a tree is more expensive than treating a tree. And if a community has, oh, and there's a few communities in Kansas that um, do have ash populations as high as 22 to 25 percent, sometimes treatments might be used to stage. And by that, I mean spread out or to delay removals. So that's generally how we broadly category, categorize why chemicals should be used. So getting back to when trees are good candidates or not for treatment, um, look at the tree on the left. Uh, I don't know, I don't, it's, it's not an ash tree, I'll tell you that, but what I want you to see here is that the root flare, the buttress roots are visible at the soil level, whereas the tree on the right side you can't see the roots. And deciduous trees should never look like a telephone pole arising out of the ground. So just by looking at the tree on the right, your first question has to be, all right, the roots are too deep. The question is next, how deep are the roots? And just looking at that picture alone, I would say that tree is not a candidate for treatment because who knows where the roots are? You could spend money and time to find out where they are, but the tree on the left, from a root standpoint anyway, is a tree worthy of treatment, whereas on the right, it's, it's just not. The, re the following pictures are not all ash trees, but I want you to see the defects that make a tree not worthy of, of treatment. When you see cracks in a tree like this, for one, call, call a commercial arborist. I mean, don't waste time. This is a bad news tree. I want you, and it's, so this is an extreme, extreme example of a crack. Cracks don't have to be this bad. Uh, ash form very weak branch unions naturally, and if they aren't pruned over the trees, you know, as the tree grows, um, weak branch unions often become cracks. So this definitely is not a tree that deserves to be treated. Fungal body growth, mushroom growth on ash trees. That is this tree, is a hackberry in this case, but uh, fungal growth is an indicator of advanced decay in the tree. And in this case, uh, the tree failed because there was so much uh, decay in the tree. And that's what I want you to see in here is that this tree definitely, if it was an ash and it had fungal bodies, definitely not worthy of treatment because it's telling you that there's a lot of decay in the tree. In any tree with large cavities, and maybe not even this large, because um, ash is not a especially decay resistant tree. I would say it's a more decay prone tree. So when you see cavities, this of course is a big cavity, but if you see several cavities in the tree, um, if you send me pictures, I'm gonna probably tell you it's not a tree worthy of treatment. Um, if you see a canopy that does not look healthy, you can see with this tree some dead wood in it. It's, it's, I don't think this is an ash tree either. I'm pretty sure it's not. But can you see just how ratty the leaves look? This is what trees under stress look like. These are water sprouts also in the canopy of the tree. This is a poor tree not worthy of treatment. And if the tree has ever been topped, these are ash trees that have been topped. These definitely are not trees worthy of treatment. We need to reserve that investment in these high quality, uh, good condition ash trees. So what's the threshold for when tr uh, treatment is effective? 
this chart from Dave Smitley, Michigan State University, he's pointing to 30% um, canopy loss as being a threshold for when the condition may compromise treatment effectiveness. Well, is the untrained eye gonna really notice uh, the tree canopy lose, you know, being at 30%? Most of the time, I don't know about you all that talk to the public, a lot of times they're talking to me anyway, when the tree's at 70 to 80% uh, of canopy loss. So what you can really see here is that this is why preventative treatment is really important and how, you know, and observing your trees um, is, is an important because we, we've got to get the treatment into the tree before too much canopy is lost. So the chemical categories, um, how am I doing for time, Sharon? Let's see, oh, looking at, I can't find my clock, hold on. Okay, well, me neither, here, here I go, I got my cell phone. Is everybody at, doing all right? We're close to 11 o'clock. Okay. So folks, I'm sure you're, you're curious about chemicals. Here's the lowdown. When I was at K-State, I took a, a chemical applicator class. And basically how I ever broke down chemical categories in my mind are whether they were contact chemicals or systemic chemicals. And in the case of treatment options for the Emerald Ash Borer, uh, you may see cover, um, uh, a cover spray used as terminology. Um, in, in the publication I'm gonna show you next, uh, they use the term cover spray and they use it mainly in trying to get the chemical on the adults. The treatment options that you're gonna see cities use that are gonna probably be the better options are gonna be the systemic options of whether it's a soil injection, a drench, a trunk injection, or bark sprays. And what I want you to see with these pictures is that trunk injections do, they, part of the process is wounding the tree. Um, anybody uh, here, I would really want you and encourage you to go to the Emerald Ash Borer National website, emeraldashbor.info, and, and download this third edition of the chemical treatment options, insecticide treatments for the EAB. That is where this chart comes from. And what I want you to see here are the different application methods. I, I don't worry at all about the, the insecticide formulations. I don't use trade names. What I want you to look at is the active ingredient and the application methods. So in the line, in the, the two thirds of the chart, the top two thirds are the products that are restricted use that you need to hire somebody with the right credentials to apply the chemical. On the bottom third of the chart, you see the products that are intended for sale to homeowners. And so those are your over-the-counter products. What you see here are the products that are suitable for soil injection or drench, for trunk injection, for the systemic basal bark sprays, and then there are the fours that could be used for cover spray, okay? So all of these treatments should be, um, should be made annually, except for the products that are imamectin benzoate. So look at the triage and the arbamectin. Those are two year uh, treatment option. It's a two year chemical. I did look up the azadiractin and uh, they, the, the uh, company information says that it could be a two year application where uh, the EAB is low. Uh, maybe in those early, early years of the EAB being in an area, but it which should be put uh, applied annually if populations are high. So for Douglas County, you should consider the azadiractin product to be an annual treatment and just the emamectin benzoate as a two-year treatment options. And there is some guidance there on recommended timing. Your chemical applicators, whoever you hire to do the work, they, they know this stuff and they, they will be paying attention to timing of the year as well. Um, if you're looking at buying products over the counter at your local garden center, understand that the label is a legal document and that you must follow the label in applying chemicals yourself. And I want you also to be aware that these products that contain imidacloprid and donateferrin, they have 
uh, use limits, uh, a requirement of use per acre. And in particular, this publication from the Kansas Department of Agriculture, I want you to see here that the amount of imidacloprid that should be applied per acre, it's really pretty small. It's about four tenths of a pound of active ingredient per acre. In dinotefron, the maximum amount of per acre per year is, is about half a pound. Why I point this out is that we, you know, if you're already putting down these products in lawn care in any other parts of your landscape, and then you want to maybe treat your own trees, um, you need to be aware of this because too much of these potentially could uh, uh, perhaps affect ground water as, as an example. So I want you to point out, you know, I want to point out just, and actually this came up when a city in Johnson County said, you know, we've got a lot of homeowners that put these products down on their lawns uh, and they wanted to be mindful of what they might be doing with their street trees. Um, these, I'll call them the poron, you know, the, the soil injections, the soil drenches, those are the products that, that will not, you, you will not be able to use them on large trees. Um, it, you, would, you would blow out of the water the, uh, the use limit per acre. These, what I would encourage these soil injections, soil drenches for are for smaller trees. But the reality is also folks, is if you've got an ash tree that's say six inches, eight inches or less, is that a tree that maybe ought to just be removed and something else planted in its place? Those, those are the things that I just want you to think about. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. These are the considerations that I want you to think about. In the cost of tree, um, and, and I'm talking pretty broadly, here's about $20 per trunk inch generally. Um, and just remember that um, most reputable companies aren't going to have time to go door to door looking for business and definitely don't be pushed to make a decision now to get a good price. Um, one way to find out if someone knows what they're talking about with the Emerald Ash Board, just ask them why they think your tree has EAB and why they recommend their course of action. I think that could be a very good screening question. Uh, Certainly in your part of the, the state, there in Douglas County and Lawrence, uh, you should have um, ISA and Kansas Arborist Association certified arborists in your area to contact. And, and if you're gonna ask them to do chemical treatment for them, make sure that they have the commercial pesticide applicators um, qualification as well. So I went through that fast. Make sure they are also a commercial pesticide applicator as well. I've noticed uh, on some websites, I, I've just been curious over the years and several years ago, I uh, was looking at some websites to see what, um, what people were talking about in regards to the, the insect. Um, one said that pruning, watering and mulching will minimize the risk of your ash tree becoming infested. What I really like about that statement is that um, it's, it's uh, promoting good cultural, good cultural care but what I want, but don't be under any illusion that just by taking good care of your ash tree, you're protecting it. If, if the tree is not being chemically treated, your, your ash is very likely to be uh, infected, highly likely to be infected. If you see anybody call the emerald ash borer a disease, they don't know what they're talking about. What I do like is that uh, there's some good direction here about looking for dieback in the tree canopy, those new sprouts, those water sprouts forming at the tree's base, woodpecker damage, and the D-shaped exit holes. Just to be more specific, the exit holes are one eighth inch. So I like the guidance that most websites are giving, but I also want you to be aware that there are other ash problems that you very well are gonna probably see. Um, this picture is from our parking lot at the Kansas Forest Service and it's two green ash side by side. The one on the left, if you can see uh, the, the canopy is bare of leaves. That poor tree, it gets the microsporelia leaf spot pretty frequently. Um, it has not been afflicted um, chronically enough, I guess I'll use that phrase, to kill the tree. But, you know, in humid years, wet years, it is just a leaf spot problem that 
you know, I expect to see on that poor tree. And there could be anthracnose on it. We could have some environmental stress. The ash lilac borer is going to be probably a very common native problem that you're going to see, borer problem in our, in our trees. It's a round hole, uh, about a half an inch if memory serves me right. You'll see some uh, ash flower gall mites on uh, ash. The red-headed ash borer is also a native ash borer that uh, very well could be found in some of our, our ash trees here. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna assume that most of you care about trees, your tree lovers, perhaps. This is just a slide just to remind me to talk about the ecosystem services of trees and what trees really do for us as people and what they do for our communities, in that they help water quality by intercepting uh, high volumes of storm water rushing into our rivers, that when we have trees along our streets, uh, we get that air quality benefit from the carbon being, the air quality benefit of air pollutants being intercepted, including carbon dioxide, all the other air pollutants. Our trees store carbon in their tissues and wood. So when we have trees helping us with these uh, air problems, air quality problems, they're helping us with our allergies, our asthma, any of these respiratory problems we, we might have. But when we have less shade along streets, uh, you know, our energy bills will go up. We have more of a heat island effect, maybe some ground level ozone formation, maybe the asphalt of the street doesn't last as long when we lose our shade. And when we lose trees in our landscape, then we're losing property values. We're losing uh, a decrease in tax revenue when our property values go down. And so then it's just this visible deterioration of our communities. So if you have lost an ash tree that you haven't planted yet, now's the perfect time to do this. If you anticipate that you're gonna lose ash trees and you have space now to plant, plant now because the time is going to come perhaps that um we're, that your your community is going to lose a large amount of trees because when we plant trees and spend the time caring for them and getting them to larger sizes we're going to receive almost a threefold return in in contribution to us so when we look at uh, for every dollar invested in community forestry, nearly three dollars is returned to us from that investment. So when we, you know, we talked early on about diversifying our neighborhoods as one thing that we can do to guard against this catastrophic loss. But in the case of the emerald ash borer, all fractionists, so I'm talking fractionous species in this country are vulnerable. And as I mentioned, we, we don't know about other members yet of the olive family. The problem of the Asian longhorn, longhorn beetle is that it favors a lot of a lot of tree species, some that are rated as good or uh, occasional host. But the Asian longhorn horn beetle thinks that maple is candy. And you know what's popular in a lot of communities? Red maple, Freeman maple, sugar maple. So knowing that this problem is in our country, Goodness, all the more reason for us to diversify our, 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 our landscapes and our community forests. But there could be another disease. There could be drought. There could be storms. We, we are going to see, I think, this continued drought spells, wet spells. Wow, what a lot to ask a tree to tolerate. So, you know, if you're, if you're uh, a type of person that doesn't mind exploring uh, new and unusual, investigate new tree species that can tolerate drought, hot locations, uh, you know, weather extremes. Uh, if you want to try something a little less common, a little more rare, just do your, just thoroughly research it. Watch for, uh, you know, maybe plant one and watch the results and expand your pa plant palette over time. I would tell my communities, you know, if, if you want to try a, uh, Oh goodness, uh, I'll think of it later. But if you want to try an unusual, let's say a black tupelo and your soils are not high in pH, I'll tell the community, hey, just, you know, try two or three. Don't go crazy on it. And if it does, well, you know, then maybe you can plant it in a few other locations. And these rare and these less common tree species are going to be perhaps hard to find. 
uh, I used to um, manage a, a garden center and if people requested certain plant material and I could add it to trucks and, and orders coming in, I would certainly entertain special orders. So don't be afraid to go to your favorite garden center or nursery and say, hey, I want to try this. Can you get it for me? And in our case at the Forest Service, we have the ability to grow a lot from seed. So if that's something you want to tinker with and you think you can be successful, you know, even growing some of these unusual and rare uh, material may be even possible from seed. So Sharon talked to me yesterday uh, uh, about, you know, one of the questions may be, you know, what can we choose uh, to replace ash with? So I threw this in this morning. Uh, the most thing you want to, you, you really need to know what your soil pH is. And if you don't know what it is, talk to the local extension office about how to collect a soil sample and, and have them send it off uh, for at least the basic test. And in the basic soil test, it's going to tell you what your soil pH is, but it's also going to tell you um, how much phosphorus and how much potassium is in your, your soil as well. So that's your really basic test because knowing your soil pH is really pretty critical because if you've ever seen a pin oak struggling with iron chlorosis, it's because the soil pH interferes with the tree's ability to take up the iron. I've also seen red maple, freeman maple, swamp white oak, uh, and I would assume that black tupelo, it, it, it is not tolerant of high pH soil. So a lot of trees are very sensitive to high pH and may become chlorotic. So knowing your soil and understanding if it's also a clay, a loam, a sand, or it's a mix of, where I live here in the, the heart of the Flint Hills, uh, my soil is extremely variable. I've got a lot of clay, and then I've got less clay, a little more loam. So understanding your site, whether it's a windy site, if the site holds water, if it won't hold water much because there's a slope, if it's full sun, part sun, those are all of the things that I want you to really um, go through a process of understanding. And be sure that the mature tree, the mature size of the tree is going to fit the width and the vertical constraints of your site. Um, and, and pay attention to how close to the sidewalk, the driveway, utility lines, the house, any buildings. Just make sure that the tree does not, at its mature size, is not going to conflict with any of these uh, infrastructure. And I put here the preferred trees for Northeast Kansas just as an example of just a list that's available to you all. It's at our website at the Kansas Forest Service. Um, the city of Lawrence, I think, refers to this list uh, as well. Um, it's just a starter list. It's the tried and true species, but if you've never heard of some of the tree names, at least it gives you a little bit of guidance of what the tree will tolerate, some of its sizes, some of its attributes. Um, Sharon, I don't know if extension, Tom, if you also have a list, but certainly folks, you have local knowledge there to tap into on what will grow best there. And I also want you to know at the Kansas Forest Service, we've been uh, putting together an Arboretum map. Uh, this actually started out of a project several years ago and we, we like to add to it as much as possible. And the criteria for being on our map is that um, uh, we can tell someone looking at the map what the tree species are that they might expect to find on the site. And then once you're on the site, either the trees are marked or you were able to download a map or a list of trees from our website. So um, you can zoom into Topeka, Lawrence, Kansas City, Pratt, wherever you might be. But what we use this map for is to try to guide people to places near them where they can find tree species. Uh, and um, you may find small trees in a lot of these arboretums or these parks, but you're also going to see some larger trees. So it's a good place to go see what a American yellowwood looks like. You know, what is that? Well, you can go and you can go look at it. And if you're at our site, uh, this more info will always lead you to uh, additional information. And if we have a website for the place, then we'll also put it there as well. Um, I am so pleased to be with you today, and you're fortunate to be in your county where you have a lot of resources to help guide you 
on tree selection. And, and I'm so glad that Sharon told me that uh, the Douglas County Fairgrounds has just become an ArbNet accredited arboretum. And look at all the different tree species that are marked on the property. So take the time, I hope folks, to get out and look there at the fairgrounds or at Lawrence Rotary Arboretum or at South Park Arboretum where they've inventoried the trees and they've identified what's there. This is really a neat and valuable resource to you to just go see what all the different kinds of trees look like around you. John and I were talking about KU's campus. They also have a nice diversity there as well. And if you're ever in Manhattan and you feel like stopping by the Kansas Forest Service, we're at 2610 Claflin Road, we would sure welcome you uh, walking our property to look at the hundred and some tree species, 30 some species of shrubs that we've planted. We are a ARBNET accredited arboretum as well, just like South Park, just like the Rotary uh, Arboretum, just like the fairgrounds. And uh, we have, um, if you go to our website, you'll be able to see a GIS map also of our trees. Uh, we have started a lot of our trees from seed, so they're small. You're, you're going to see some really pretty small trees, but you're going to see some small trees that are really taking off. You're going to see some tried and true trees. We've been planting shrubs for pollinator, uh, you know, to be able to show our folks that uh, purchase conservation seedlings from us, what some of our pollinator plants look like. And if you can see there west of our building, um, were you right here in this area? This is our honor grove. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Um, our honor grove, where we have a lot of larger trees that are marked there as well. So folks, I know um, <laughs> I'm probably a little bit long on time. I warned Sharon, that's one of my faults. Uh, uh, I, I don't have a problem talking for an hour, but I certainly appreciate your time. I certainly appreciate your tuning in today. Uh, this resource list, I want, I'd want. i like for folks to know where I get all of my information from and what the resources are near you. So this resource list, as well as uh, these links to the treatment options for the Emerald Ash Borer, these certainly are available if you don't have them already. So at this point, I, I am done and I certainly am happy to uh, answer any questions. Well, thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, we've been, uh, a lot, of course, talking about emerald ash borer out at the Extension office in Douglas County and among master gardeners for a while, um, but I certainly learned a few new things in your presentation, so thank you. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat box, and then we'll open it up to the, to the floor, as you say. Um, so I'll take them in the order I received. Um, a comment somebody made um, from Lawrence um, who says she has a mountain ash. Now I know that's a different genus. It so is. So can you, can you speak to that? And yes, thank you. Were? Yes, so, mount, so the problem with common names is that they're used commonly. So mountain ash would lead you to believe that it is an ash, but actually it is not of the Fraxinus genus. It is, I think it's Sorbus, S-O-R-B-U-S. So mountain ash are not uh, affected by the EAB. They are of a different genus and a different species, okay. of course. Thank you. Um, also, a question here that I'm sure a number of people have is if you have an infected ash, ash tree, how do you dispose of an infected ash tree? So if, so if the tree is small, and you feel like you can safely remove it yourself without harm to you or property, then removing the tree and taking it to your local disposal site uh, would be appropriate. Do not take it to the family farm uh, out of the quarantine zone. So maybe, um, let's see how talented I am here. I want you all to understand where it's okay to move um, ash wood is a regulated item. I didn't want to dig into the, to the details of regulated items, but can you all see my cursor here? And I'm looking up at my big screen so I can see too. Where you can see this blue line for Kansas, that is the quarantine zone. No ash, no part of an ash tree is to come out of the quarantine zone. 
Don't take it to your family farm in central Kansas. Don't take it to uh, Osage County. Uh, don't take it to Melvert, any reservoir that is not in this quarantine zone. If your tree is larger and you need to hire someone to remove the tree, they should know this already and they should be disposing of it locally. Chances are everything uh, can go to your wood disposal sites there. Okay, our next question, um, I'm gonna read this here. Um, I understand the need and importance for tree diversity, but how does that impact the balance of native trees versus non-native trees? We pay a lot of attention to the need for native trees and plants, but these diseases are specifically targeting those and they have no natural defense. Where is the tipping point for our environment if we introduce more non-natives for diversity? Well, and, and I, you have, that question is actually hit on something that I've been, I've been thinking about probably the last two or three years because we know that our natives are, they, they provide so much to us for the pollinator benefit, for the wildlife, you know, for our, our, our well, for our, our fauna especially. I don't want to get too deep into this, but I had a chance to listen to a professor from, um, I always, I hope I don't screw up his university. I think it's Northern Arizona University. And he spent the day uh, talking to the, um, it was an advanced training for the Kansas Arborist Association. And I go to that conference every year. And he talked about the fact that with the warming climate, and he was just pointing to his to research and he was pointing to, you know, the data that is showing that we're warmer than we used to be. And he's, he talked about, um, one of his quotes is, native trees are wonderful. He says, but what if our native trees aren't able to, to uh, uh, tolerate what's yet to come? So he really got me thinking about and what we've done at our agency, at our Arboretum, is we are testing um, as much plant material as we're able to and have space for from the southern U.S. Uh, uh, and the southwestern U.S. We're, we're testing material that also comes from dry, warm uh, areas of the state because we want to find out if that material can live in Manhattan, Kansas. Um, he used the term assisted migration. So to answer the question, what I think, I think it's important to continue planting the native trees that we know do well here in Kansas. But if you ever have a chance to plant maybe a Southern Oak from Texas and you do your research and you really believe that it, it could be something that could be tolerated here, plant one, see how it does. Um, in community forestry, we are planting non-native trees. We, I feel that we have to look at some non-natives um, just for the fact that we need to keep trees in the landscape. So you're right. The question was well worded. It is a delicate balance. I guess I would always favor a landscape heavier in natives with the understanding that maybe a native only landscape may need to be supplemented. And in community forestry and tree plantings that I'm involved with, we are supplementing um, landscape diversity with some non-native uh, plant material. Thank you. That um, was an important question and gave, really gave us something to really think deeply about in terms of our landscapes and what we yeah. plant in them. Um, well, we're learning. We're learning, to, aren't yeah. we? Mm -hmm. we're gonna, we're, I think we have to learn what other plant material will live in this part of the state. And so at yes, the Forest things, Service, things we're willing changing. to accept, they are. And, and at our place in Manhattan, we're willing to accept failure if we can learn that, okay, this plant was not gonna live here. And so for us, that's why we're testing a lot because we wanna learn. We, wa we wanna learn what can live and not live. Yes, thank you for that um, response. You're, you're and um, before I open it up to the floor, I want to say that yes, this is being recorded and it will be available on um, the Douglas County Extension website uh, next week. So, 
Um, now I'd like to open it up to the floor. Would anybody like um, to ask a question? Hi, Kim. This is Tom Buller. I don't know that I have a question, but you did kind of call us out on a few things, so I wanted to provide a little bit of feedback on those. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't know over the past year or two that I've seen a, a dramatic increase in the number of questions about emerald ash borer. Uh, okay. but, but driving around town, I definitely do see uh, a, a lot of affected ash trees. So I don't know if people are just uh, not going to figure it out till their trees are further down on the decline than, than they already are. And then they'll call us or um, if they figured out other solutions. But we definitely do get a number of questions every year. But in the three years I've been here, that seems to be pretty steady. Um, and, and the other thing is, um, you mentioned uh, recommended trees, and we do go with the, the Northeast Kansas recommended tree list from the Forest Service, so we don't have a special okay. list for Douglas County. Well, and Tom, while, while we're talking here, uh, that list is due to be updated, so uh, when I'm ready to undertake that, hopefully sooner than later, I'll get hold of you. So folks, just understand that the list, I think it's still a good list, but it may be updated as well. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Other questions from the floor? Um, and if not, um, last chance, there's just a comment uh, that somebody said maybe we ought, in response to Kim's comment just a moment ago, uh, thinking about starting to plant from seven, zone seven. And I know recently we were moved, I can't remember when it was, we were moved from zone, we were just recently in the past few years moved to zone six. Uh, I don't remember when that change was, Kim, you might, or Tom, you might. Um, but thinking about zone seven now. Well, so from, for, for me, you know, we're, we, we grow quite a bit of our plant material from seed. So our cost to test something isn't all that high, other than some time, some water, mulch, that type of thing. Um, you know, if you're willing to do that, you know, that's always a possibility. Um, the, these rare and uncommons, I just really encourage you to do your homework. And I'll just comment on that also. Um, those zones are defined by, you know, sort of minimum temperatures. And one challenge we have if we really try and push those and, and plant outside of our, our sort of current zone is with climate change, we do still see a lot of extremes. Um, so a couple of years ago, we had minimum temperatures that fell below our zone rating. Uh, I know a lot of people, uh, not with trees, but with grapes, lost a, a lot of grapes that they were trying to do that pushing the zone. So if, if you do want to experiment, uh, that's great. Uh, but I would definitely consider it an experiment. I wouldn't feel safe planting trees from zone seven. Yeah. I agree. Let's see. It would how about an umbrella or nanum catalpa? So nana is a dwarf, right? So we're are we talking Catalpa speciosa, help me. I, I don't know. The person asking the question maybe could clarify. Oh, Catalpa bungii, bungii. Bignoides. Big, big no no Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think I have seen that species in Johnson County. I can't say that I've seen it much. Tom, John, John, you're a... Yeah, we, we have a few here in Lawrence. Do you? There, okay. there aren't a lot, but the, some of them look pretty nice. I have one near my apartment here. Okay. And, um, um, you know, if you, if you like that, I mean, they don't, of course, have the form of a real catalpa. <laughs> they're, I mean, they're weird. Uh, but if you like that kind of weirdness, uh, you give them a try. Sure. They're doing okay. I've seen them, but just very rarely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, John. Yeah, I have one in my backyard that birds planted, and <laughs> it's going great guns. <laughs> and uh, Kim, if you have time, we've got one more question. You betcha. Uh, last question. Uh, 
a comment at a previous seminar speaker, a uh, speaker said to shift to the west, not south on plants to adjust with weather change. Well, I think you can do that too. Um, we uh, would like to add gamble oak, uh, which um, I've seen out in Colorado Springs in the front range. We would like to add gamble oak to our arboretum. Um, I sat in on a webinar about the mountain, uh, the dry mountain areas. Uh, it was kind of based on um, the landscape palette out in like Western Colorado, Utah, the Mountain West, I guess. I tuned into that webinar hoping to pick up maybe some species that they talk about from there that we can try at our place. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, we're not just pulling from the south. We're also pulling from more arid, you know, areas of, of the country. Uh, definitely. Yeah, I think that's certainly a direction to look to as well. I and think if you... Go ahead. Yeah, I think if you look at preferred trees from, say, Wichita or Oklahoma City, um, and also maybe look at lists of uh, trees uh, carried by um, nurseries in those areas, you, you do start to find some different things that we should be probably trying more often here. Yeah. As an experiment, of course. I would love to get to the Denver Botanic Garden sometime and just spend a day wandering around there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and with that, I, I'm going to let Chris close it out, but um, I think the word of the day is experiment with your trees. Planting more trees can never be a bad thing. So, um, well, and it depends on your risk, your risk level on right. whether you want to stick with some tried or trues or try something, you know, more unusual. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to thank turn you. it over to Chris to close us out. Thank you, everyone. Kim, it was great. Love the presentation. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you. And we will see you um, on another Zoom session someday soon, I'm sure. So. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.